Okay, we are now live, and I have Simona Ciccarelli. Did, did I pronounce that right? No, it's pronounced Ciccarelli, like China. Oh, I've been saying it the wrong way all along. So <laughs> Don't worry, can, everybody does. Let me see if I can do that. Simona Ciccarelli. That's perfect. Did, did I get it? <laughs> yes, absolutely. First okay. try right. Um, so I... I wanted to, so I, I'm basically calling this video and we can change it, but basically it's something about landing your first children's book. Um, and if that's not an appropriate title, we can change it later. But I, I'm going to just talk a little bit about how I met you. Um, so people watching can, can kind of, um, understand, um, uh, where we're going with this. And then I have a bunch of questions for you. So basically, uh, you know, I started svslearn.com with Jake Parker and Lee White. And I'm going to silence my phone. <laughs> and I, I saw that um, you were posting in the forums and, you know, you were taking classes and, and subscribed and everything. And, and uh, I saw like your artwork caught my eye, right? Really pretty early on. I was like, oh, this is, this is unique looking stuff. This is really cool. And then over, I guess, the course of the last, what, couple years, Yes. yes, year and a half, more or less. Yes. Yeah, uh, I saw some like big leaps and improvements and stuff, and 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 then I saw you post something on I think it was on Facebook about um, getting your first job or in the forums yeah. or something like that. So I was like, okay, I have to talk to this this woman because it's for me, um, you know, you you kind of forget what it's like, what your thought processes were like in the beginning, and. Um, it's it's always interesting to me to find out how someone else kind of broke into the business and and you know and that that whole thing. So um, I want to talk about that, but before we actually talk about that, I was I was being a sleuth and I was poking around on your Facebook, and um, I saw that you're like you're like a scientist or something, right? Yes. <laughs> so I need to find I need to I need to get the backstory from you. On like how okay. can you can you tell us like what what you've been doing, and how you ended up in art? There's also some animation thrown in there or something. Yeah, my life in five minutes. Okay, yeah, there um, you go. So yes, I am a scientist. I graduated in chemistry ages ago, and and went on and had a PhD in chemistry as well, and then went on a postdoc, and uh, and ended up working in research in medicinal chemistry. So in research for new drugs and medicine and worked there for 11 years, more or less, as wow. a professional scientist. So it was a big chunk of my life, but life is long. So, <laughs> so that, uh, I don't yeah. think I've ever met an, a children's book illustrator who's also a scientist. Now, I think there are a few, actually. There are a few also on the ESBS forum. So oh, really? It's not completely unusual. Um, I, I mean, I was always doing illustration a little bit on the side. I did a couple of, of magazine covers for scientific magazines and, um, you know, cartoons mostly. Um, some of them also landed in articles. So I wasn't, I wasn't getting paid or anything, but I was doing illustration on the side. And it, it was like the one career I wanted to do when I was a young person that sort of decided against for many reasons. Partly was, um, you know, I don't. I'm not sure I can make a living with it. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, I was I was interested in science, and I was, uh, um, you know, academic. The academic world fascinated me, so I wanted to try it out, and so I decided to go into science. And then, you know, one thing follows another, and you end up at 39 or so, and you look back, and we all know this feeling, and you start thinking, is that really what I wanted to do? And you know, things were doing great, but maybe not, you know, completely satisfying. And and I kept thinking, you know, I, I always wanted to do illustration. Maybe I should go back and, and do illustration instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that's how it happened. So in 2011, I enrolled in art school and, and they recognized my bachelor. So I could, I could go for a master program and, um, and I did it completely online at the Academy of Arts University in San Francisco. And it was an awesome experience. I graduated in 2016. And during that time, I actually changed jobs. So I 
I stopped doing research and I started working in scientific communication. So I was doing some animation uh, work um, about you know scientific topics, um, viruses and bacteria and stuff like that. And and I really enjoyed it and it was very successful. And through that, I got a job as art director um, in, in corporate communication. So then I exited the world of science more or less completely. Um, and yeah, now I, I'm still working as art director, but only on a part-time contract. Um, so I can dedicate the rest of the time completely to illustration. And I decided to, to enter the children's book world. Wow. So as art director, you could hire me. Uh, yes, theoretically, <laughs> I could. <laughs> so you're you're a scientist, an art director, animator, children's book illustrator. Uh, are are there other careers that are going to happen after this? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> well, I'm trying to write. <laughs> that, oh, that's great. I was. That's one of the questions that I actually had for you. Um, is is are you you know writing? Yeah, I, I'm trying to. Yeah. I'm trying to. So I yeah. It's wow. tough. It's like learning a completely new discipline. So right. it's not now to be underestimated. Now you're um, Italian, right? Is that yeah. right? And then, yeah. um, but you're living in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's right. So why don't you um, talk a little bit about, um, well, first off, so you, you, you got a, um, a, you said you got a bachelor's degree from the Art Academy of Art Institute in San Francisco. Is that right? Yeah, a master, yes. Okay, a, a master's? Yeah. <laughs> so why would you then come to SVS? Uh, oh, that's a good question, <laughs> but um, I actually, I actually, am, I'm in love with learning uh -huh. in a way that's probably the, the most constant part in my life throughout all my careers and, and all the jobs I've done. That's the one thing that always lights me up is learning something new. And uh, when, when the academy finished, I was like, yeah, where can I go on learning now? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and also there was this element, I mean, I, I landed on SVS because I, was, uh, I graduated in, in concept art, um, but I realized already before the end of the studies that that was not a viable career in a way because it's mostly studio mm. jobs and there are no studios around here. And yeah, of course you can do freelance concept art, but it's relatively hard to break into that. Mm. Um, and you, I was so not totally sure. You didn't want to leave. You don't want to leave Switzerland for a for a studio mm. job. No, well, I cannot really leave Switzerland. My whole family lives and works here, so oh. it's not I'm not that mobile right. at the time being. Um, so it was not no, and I, I don't really I wasn't really interested in leaving Switzerland at that time point. Um, so I was starting to look into, okay, I've, uh, you know, I've done concept art for animation. What else can I do? And a children's book was more or less um, an obvious choice. And, and SVS is, I think, the number one resource out there if you want to look into children's book illustration. Uh, and that's how I, you know, became aware of the existence of this, of this set of tools and materials and courses and, and that's what completely turned around my portfolio in the end. There is nothing in my portfolio that was there when I graduated. Mm. It's all built and grown during, during the time where I followed SBS courses and forums and discussions and YouTube channels and all that stuff. Now, I'm not paying you to say any of this, right? <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, it's... <laughs> It, maybe it would have been different if I had actually followed that as a major, but coming out as a concept artist, I had absolutely no clue about children's publishing, and that's yeah. you know the most the the major resource I could find. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a niche for sure, and um, a lot of a lot of art programs don't really spend a lot of time talking about children's books, and it's it's a it's it's a hard thing to break into if you don't have that information. Um, okay, so. So then you you started uh, you started working towards um, going into the children's book market. Let's let's just have you keep going. Like how I, I don't know what you're working on. I don't know how you landed anything, but I think that that would be really interesting to people to find out. Um, you know that whole thing. So whatever you can share. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so it starts basically in 2016. I'm graduated from art school. My portfolio is full of character turnarounds and 3D modeling because that was what I was in love with at that time. And I was sort of almost convinced I would go into 3D, um, you know, character modeling. Uh, and then I realized maybe in four or five months, four or five months after graduating, well, that's not really what I want to do. And maybe it's not even such an easy career if you don't move out of Switzerland. Uh, so, you know, what else can I do? Children's book is, you know, um, was part of my interests and my passions. And it was fully in line with the kind of art I was doing, even though there was nothing there that was viable for children's book. And, you know, SBS as a resource really helped me to turn around my portfolio. It really helped to understand what, what are editors looking for? What are art directors in children's publishing looking for? What kind of art you need to be doing? Um, evidently not, non, nothing of what was in my portfolio at that time was suitable. <coughs> so it was, you know, big, change of direction in a way. Uh, even though the fundamentals probably were there, I you know, I have the feeling still there has been uh, an improvement in the course of the two years. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> I'm getting over a cold. <coughs> oh, I was worried that was gonna happen. <coughs> oh, oh, sorry, keep going. All right. <laughs> Yeah, it was just not the right stuff, okay? And um, yeah, and, and you and SVS and the children's book illustration courses, which are, I think, the most important influences there for me, really helped me to understand what needs to go in there. Um, so I spent basically two years, uh, you know, doing new work and checking out the old one and starting social media channels, which I didn't have. And, you know, posting regularly, and also I have to credit Jake Parker with, uh, you know, bringing in how you deal with social media and what you need to do uh, to grow a following and to be noticed and to be out there. Um, so that's basically what happened in the course of, of these two years. It's a lot of work, uh, and I think many people underestimate the amount of work it takes to, you know, build a portfolio that is noticeable for the people you want to reach. Sorry. <laughs> You've muted yourself. Well, we went to we went to Hawaii to the Comic-Con over there. And I think that just the change in environment and everything and I picked up a cough over there. I didn't cough at all yesterday. <laughs> oh gosh. And I didn't cough at all this morning and I thought, "Oh, I'm I'm over it." Okay. <laughs> so, okay, how how about um so did you end up getting a book? Did I, am I, yes. am I right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So first thing I got was an agent. Um, I didn't look for an agent. She found me in a way, um, but we still had a lot of conversations and I checked out our clients and, um, you know, asked a bunch of questions before we actually signed up. Well, I actually signed up with her. Um, it's, I think a necessary step in a way. I'm not sure. I, I'm sure there are alternative uh, routes, but for me, it's been pivotal to get somebody that could represent me uh, on that turf, uh, you know, in New York where the big publishing is. I don't did, think I would have. Did you say she found you or you found her? She found me. Okay. So, and yeah. How did she find you? She found me on Twitter. Oh. So yeah, social media has really worked for me. I, the only consistent marketing or self marketing I've been doing, um, I haven't done any noticeable, you know, poster campaign. I've sent out a few, but brought nothing. Uh, I think what has really helped me is going to conferences. Uh, so ACBWI conference in New York and, um, here in Europe, uh, going to the Bologna book fair, um, this past March. Uh, and you and you know, and getting out there, I'm not, I'm not a very outgoing person, actually, and and I can relate to all the people that are terrified of speaking with art director at at, uh, at these events. Uh, but for me, it's, it's work. 
You know, it's not something that comes naturally. It's not something that I enjoy doing. Uh, it's part of, of the job. It's part of the tasks you have to do. And if there's one thing that professional career teaches you is that not all things relating to your job are enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> there's stuff yeah. you just have to go through. <laughs> Uh, so, if, you know, going in with that attitude, I know I have, I have to talk with these people, I have to present myself, I have to introduce myself, and I, I go with a different attitude um, than what would come naturally for me. But this way, I've, I've established a few contacts. Uh, then some, you know, some work is coming through social media. I've done some educational projects that came in through social media. Um, I've um, worked from, for a Canadian publisher and then Another project came in from a company, uh, also through social media, and at, but at that point I was already signing with my agent, so that um, sort of changed the dynamics a little bit. Uh, and and she helped. I mean, she was pitching me um, with New York publishers, so with the publishers, and and that's how I finally managed to get a, a book a trade book contract. Wow! Uh, thanks to her. I mean, it's definitely not something I would have being able to do by myself in, in this mm -hmm. time frame. So sure. you so you were posting are you I haven't been on your Twitter. Are you um really active on Twitter? Are you casually active? Like I am casually active on Twitter. i I'm not very consistent. I've been posting every day for maybe a year, but then let it drop. Um I've been a little bit more consistent on Instagram and, and I got you know this educational job for example came via instagram mm. uh and and there i've been posting three times a week mm. for yeah a good year and a half maybe a year how many followers do you have on instagram i have to look at your instagram five thousand and a handful i think you said did you say five yes do i follow you on instagram if not i will Let's, now one more. What's that? Now I have one more. Yes. Now, yeah. Okay. Five thousand. Okay. So your Instagram is a healthy size, but it's not gargantuan like some people's. Yeah. And you you say you you do get some work off of Instagram, huh? Yeah. And wow. I get work off Behance. So Behance, is, yeah. Behance is probably the the best uh, social media site for me. Really. Yeah, I got I got a lot of inquiries. Now I'm turning them all down mostly because it's a lot of self-publishing authors. Mm -hmm. um, but I did get, for example, this company. This company actually found me via Behance, and I'm doing three books for them. So that I'm working on the second one right now. Oh, great. Um, okay, so and in there we also you also mentioned that you went to the SCBWI in New York City. Is that right? And then yeah. Bologna Book Fair and um, do you feel like going to those helped you get work or did they help you? Uh, yeah. Like, do you want to talk about that just a little bit? Um, so I'm not sure about SCBWI. For me, it was more like, um, dipping the toes in the industry and mm -hmm. seeing how the heart of the industry beats. And that was really interesting. Um, I think it's an essential, I, to me, it's, it's essential. Maybe it's, you know, the scientific path. Of course, I used to go to conferences all the time, and, and it's really important when you're working in science. And, and so I approach this with the same with the same attitude, like, okay, I need to know how this industry works. I need to go where these people are meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was very helpful um, to, to see how, you know, how these people talk, um, what interests them, what's the vibe, what's the atmosphere. Um, I don't, I, of course, I left a bunch of postcards and I participated in a portfolio showcase. So you never know what may come out of that. Uh, but I didn't have anything concrete, any concrete follow ups from, from the New York conference. Mm -hmm. I did have two concrete follow ups from the Bologna book fair. So I talked with, uh, with several art directors there. Uh, I had very good interactions and very good conversations and I got two educational jobs out of Bologna. Uh, so it's still maybe not the high flying job, but you know it's good to know that it's worth going. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, you know, working on on projects, the the more experience you get. I know a lot of people, a lot of a lot of illustrators seem to think that you know you're being taken advantage of if you're not getting paid top dollar. 
Um, but th sometimes the experience is, really helps you on future projects, you know, and so I, that's yeah. how I, that's how I, how I classified it early on. And I can point to a lot of uh, projects that I did that I didn't get paid that well for, but that really did help me get other work. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. I mean, I, I'm, I took jobs that were definitely not worth my time in terms of money, uh, but it, it was not the point. You know, I was not doing them for the money. I was mm -hmm. doing, you know, my first book paid, I think, twelve hundred dollars. Uh, so it's definitely not sustainable career-wise. But right. yeah, he's the first book. I've never done a book before. Let's right. take it and see how it goes. That that was a very important experience. Even just knowing that, yeah, you can do it and you can do it within deadline and, you know, yeah. the art director is happy. Uh, yeah, so the next one is going to be much more comfortable. <laughs> well, I find it interesting that so, that people will, um, they don't seem to have a problem in general with the idea of interns working for free. <laughs> and and they're getting taken advantage of. You could, you, I mean, you could make that argument. But you getting paid $1,200 to do a book is kind of like a paid internship in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so a lot of it is how you phrase it in your mind. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've, I'm in the privileged position that I don't need to earn money yet. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, it's getting better and it's, you know, it's slowly coming along in a, in a area where, you know, you could think about making a, a career, a full-time career out of it, but mm -hmm. I still have my leg firmly in a contract job that pays regular salary. Mm. And, and I think this is something that Lee White also says uh, several times, keep your day job. And yeah. it's, uh, you know, you guys have been, have been instrumental also in, in guiding a little bit career decisions because I really wanted to just go in full time. Mm. Uh, but listening to your experiences and your advice, you know, really open my eyes saying, okay, take it easy because uh, it, it's going to take a while. Yeah. It takes yeah. a while. Yeah. Um, now you're, you're saying with your contract work that you're talking about the art director position that you yes. have. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so then let's talk about this trade book. That's, that's the exciting thing, right? Yes. Well, that's announced so I can talk about it. So it's uh, for Sterling. Um, and it's coming out in, I think, April next year. Um, and it's a book, it's a nonfiction or creative nonfiction book um, about the moon. Uh, so it, it follows a bunch of, of kids that basically the, the title of the book is If You Had Your Birthday Party on the Moon. Oh, cool. So it imagines this bunch of kids going and having a birthday party on the moon and all the things they may experience, you know, um, the fact that balloons don't fly and the fact that gravity is very low. So it, it introduces nonfiction topics or educational topics about space and the moon, but in this uh, fictional context. So it's, it's a very fun book. I really enjoyed it. Oh, cool. So, are you are you finished illustrating it? Yes. It's, oh, nice. I was, I was thinking April. It's got to be in production about right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I finished and we're good. Nice. So, um, so you got the um, the the um, uh, the agent contacted you, and then you sent your agent a bunch of work and then they went and sh showed it around i assume and then came to you with that contract um yeah you feel like your agent was happy with the work that you did on that um i i guess so <laughs> <laughs> i i cannot really say when my agent is happy or not happy but <laughs> <laughs> I think so far is working well. I mean, how, she's how, a literary agent, so she's she's also looking at my manuscripts, which I really appreciate because it's a different perspective than than critique groups or or you know simply other interested people that look at your writing. And and her perspective is a lot more brutal in a way, but also a lot more savvy. So right, it's helping. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna try to share my screen. I just show people your work in case. So you're at, you're at um, Simona Sicarelli, or your SM Sicarelli, or I'm sorry, yeah. Ciccarelli. Yeah, that's right. I, it's hard to re relearn a name, you know, like I remember reading The Call of the Wild. This is going to be embarrassing. 
And I didn't know how to pronounce a French word. So I thought Francois was Francois. And I I just could not ever see that word and <laughs> and pronounce it Francois. Okay. Um, great. Just really, really fun work. Um, do you know if you're, if the art director was happy with the work that you did? Uh, yeah, she was happy. She yeah. was happy. I haven't still, I still need to hear back her final approval, but so far I've shared all along the way. And uh, so far she seems very happy. So I'm confident even if there are changes that they're not going to be major. Things. Awesome. So any other um, projects in the works that through your agent, any, you're yeah, up for. Um, I'm working on the second book for this company. It's a microelectronics company in Texas. Uh, oh, they're doing a series of books on microelectronics for children. For some reason, I, I am sort of uh, getting into nonfiction or creative nonfiction. Maybe it's because of you know my legacy, my career, and, and it seems that you know it's easier maybe to position me for that kind of job. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't mind. I, I mean, it's a lot of fun, and maybe that's my niche, and maybe that's that's how it's going to be. Um, and you know, I'm writing mostly fiction, so if I ever happen to sell one of my manuscripts, it's going to be a fiction, mm -hmm. um, a fiction book. But the the jobs I've been doing so far have been either educational or nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, maybe interesting also for illustrators to consider you know what are their strengths specifically and how can they play off them right uh, getting even more specialized in within the field yeah you you tend to get known for certain things and then you get asked to do those things and hopefully those are the things you love doing but i think the the really neat thing about writing is if you're not getting the type of work that you want to do specific you know the exact type you can certainly write the kind of stories that you want to illustrate and if you're successful in selling them that's going to definitely move you in the, in the right direction yeah. um so are you taking any writing classes yes actually i yeah. <laughs> it seems like i'm a class addict but it's true <laughs> in a way I, I just love to learn and and i think the internet is awesome because you know you can learn your whole life it's Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I've, I'm enrolled in um, the ECL, the Institute of Children Literature uh, in Madison, I think they are. Uh, and they have some online courses, and I'm doing a course there um, for writing for children and teens. Mm -hmm. um, has, your, has your agent given you any good feedback? Uh, yes, she has. I mean, she's give, she gives very, very insightful feedback. Mm -hmm. Uh, because her feedback is uh, informed by industry knowledge. So, mm. you know, she doesn't just say this manuscript is good or this manuscript is bad. She says this manuscript won't sell. Um, you know, it's, it's not a judgment of value or of, you know, the quality of the writing. It's more a judgment on, um, you know, what's the market situation and how high are the chances that we will actually succeed in, in placing this one. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's a little bit, it takes, a, it took a little bit of getting used to, you know, especially when you're at the beginning and you're trying your hand at something new and you're not totally sure it's going to work out. Uh, and, and maybe you want to have feedback on, you know, is it good or is it bad? And that's not coming. It's more around, mm -hmm. this is not going to sell. This has no market or you know, this is going to be difficult. Um, but in, in the long run, I think that's really useful because it's, it, helps you to set the direction a little bit more clearly. Right. Um, so yeah, I sent her a lot of manuscripts and she has been really kind in looking through all of them. And she has picked one for actually pitching uh, without success so far, but that's also part of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and she has picked a, a couple more to work through successive drafts. So that's, I'm working on them right now. Um, to see if you know they stand a chance of getting into a shape that can be considered, and we have just pitched one to uh, a smaller publisher who had a very specific request uh, and, and an open call, and I brought I brought something and, uh, and we decided to pitch it to them. So um, yeah, she's 
I think, you know, having an agent has pros and cons and you have also, um, you know, expressed them extensively in, in your videos. Uh, for me at the moment, it's, it's very, it's been very, very important. Uh, maybe it's because I'm not in the US, so, you know, it's difficult if you are outside of, of, of the United States to, um, you know, to know what's going on and to know how to, how to place yourself. Um, I think that, that really helps to have somebody there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so too. And I, I've met quite a few illustrators from Europe that I get the sense just from talking to them, um, that they feel like they're on the outside looking in because they're not here. But I would bet that in reality, they're just a few connections away from having the same um, opportunities as anybody living here. It's it's more perception, I would say. Um, that's just my my gut feeling on it because I I also know a lot of illustrators that live abroad or, or that live in other parts of the world that are very successful and they're published here regularly. Um, so I you know I would conclude that you don't have to live here, but having an agent here is probably, you're probably, that's probably the only thing that you really need, you know? Yeah. 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 I think, yeah. Unless you travel to the U S frequently and, and, you know, have a chance to interact with, with the people in the industry there, I think you need, you need an agent there. Yeah. Um, at, at least that's my experience so far. Yeah. Maybe it changes when, when you know when you're a little bit more experienced, but I am completely at the beginning of the journey. So. Mm -hmm. Well, your work is amazing. I mean, it, it really is. It, and I, when you first started posting in our forums on SVS Learn, I, I was like, this person isn't just starting out. I, but I, and that's one of the things that was, I was curious <laughs> about is because I was like. This, this work is great. Like who, where did this person go to school? You know, like it's just, it's just too, I'm looking at your wizard of Oz stuff again right now on the screen. And it's just that, and actually that really caught all of our eyes. Cause we were doing, I think we were doing the, um, the competitions at the time we were looking at work on the site and Lee and, and Jake and I were looking at this one in, in particular and going, this is like really, really professional work going on here so like why isn't this person out there working and then it was shortly after you announced that you had your your book assignment but it sounds like you have an, a, a pretty extensive body of work that you've also been doing other than the trade book a lot of people tend to um you know especially in the children's book world they they look at your career only by the 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 big trade books that you've had published you know like, like, art, you know, art directors in the industry and editors and stuff, they're like, in their, in their world, that's the only illustration that exists when in reality, illustrators work on all kinds of projects that, that they just don't even care about or know about. So yeah. it's exciting to get that first big trade book because that basically does start your career in their eyes. In, in the yeah, that's industry. my hope as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um. Okay, so that's really cool. So you, so and the, the, you know, you getting the agent—that's the thing that that I talk about a lot um, it, to to up and coming illustrators. I, I know we've got people watching right now. I'm I'm purposely not looking at the questions because I there's no way I can pay attention to what you're saying and read the questions <laughs> at the same time. So I know there's probably some really good um, chat going on, um, but. Um, that one of the ideas that I really like to to push is that, you know, a, agents really are doing the heavy lifting for for mm -hmm. editors right now, and they really are the gatekeepers. We we think it's I got to contact the publisher, but it's really, you know, breaking in and getting that agent a, a good one, um, and definitely not paying an agent. You know that there are people out there that are that are pretending to be agents that that want you to pay them. You should never have to pay. You know, you're not paying your agent, right? No, of course not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been that would have been embarrassing if you <laughs> No, I don't. No, she gets a commission, of course. Yeah. Um yeah, you pay your agent after they get you the, the work. Um but yeah, so um okay, so let's what what um 
so you say you're writing, but like what um, other projects are you working on? Anything else that you'd like to talk about? Um, well, there's the thing is the things you see on my portfolio and the things you see on social media, they are all non-client work. Uh, and you know, that's, that's also advice that came from you guys. It's like, you know, you have to keep working on stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not, that's something as I know from the hard director side, you can't post your client work, uh, you know, the work you're doing for clients, you right. cannot post the majority of cases you cannot publish. And even if you could, it's probably not a good idea. Um, and the stuff I'm pitching, you know, out there, book dummies or, or stuff that is out on, on uh, you know, trying to sell, you cannot post that either. Right. I mean, you, you shouldn't at least it's, you know. So just to clarify what you're talking about is, um, just to, just to clarify what you're talking about is you can't post it until it's published. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You can't post until it's published. So it means that if you want to keep your portfolio live and your social media live, you need to keep working on other stuff. <laughs> and that's, that's been the big realization for me. It's like, okay, you've got, uh, if you don't have client work, you better work on your own stuff because to get client work, you need to be out there. Uh, yeah. And even when you have client work, you still need to be working on other projects because you need to keep being out there. And I don't know, I think, I think your portfolio should be always let's say at maximum one year old, mm -hmm. maybe one and a mm -hmm. half year old. Uh, so you, you have to keep changing stuff around and throwing out old stuff and putting in new stuff. So I always have some kind of, let's call them alibi projects going on. So stuff I set myself as a project, even though nobody commissioned it and there is no direct uh, request to do anything. Mm -hmm. So at the moment I am, I'm working on a series of five illustrations um trash pollution <laughs> 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 because you know seeing as it was that uh, yeah, i was working mostly non-fiction but my portfolio is all fiction work i said well maybe i should add some north some non-fiction stuff to my portfolio mm -hmm. so i picked a, a topic that i am interested in and uh, and i and i always try to combine things so there is the bologna book fair exhibition deadline coming out um, I didn't manage to get in last year, as you know, you have to keep trying. So mm -hmm. let's try to get in this year. And they asked for five illustrations, either unpublished or published in the last year. And so I decided to enter with nonfiction illustrations this year. And I'm working on that, um, that project at the moment. Oh, cool. Right. <laughs> I, did um, an I, I was just gonna say, I did an illustration once for a magazine and it was a, a long horizontal and it went from completely uh, polluted water, uh, trash and with like smokestacks and, and then it transitioned slowly over to a clean environment. So you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a sort of idea. And then, then of course my brain starts divagating and I wrote a story to it and I think maybe this could become a book. Uh, and then I said, I, I, you know, um, I talked, I talked it over with my agent and she says, ah, it's saturated and difficult to position. And, and then you just let it fall. But still, these are, this is the project I'm going, I'm working on on the side at the moment. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I'm always trying to, um, to find some kind of assignment for myself. Um, at the moment, the time is a little limited, but when I didn't have uh, client work going on, I would set myself, I don't know, draw 100 children and post them on social media or, you know, throw story dice and make up three illustration with whatever comes out. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> so, so explain that. So you would you would do like three different words or something? Yeah, you know, you know, story dice, they have like little oh, images yeah, yeah, yeah. instead of numbers. Yeah. And the idea is that you would throw them and whatever comes out, you would build a story out of it. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's how the dinosaur illustrations came into being. So oh. it was like throwing story dice and I had a dinosaur fence and a, uh, and a woman's shoe. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you start, 
revolving that in your head. And then, then I came out with this world where dinosaurs live in houses and have very suburban lifestyles. Uh, and that's how these, those illustrations came into being. Wow. That, that's something that I really miss from art school. It's the constant pressure of doing art. Mm. And, and when you're out of that, you fall into the hole. And I think many people graduating from art school have that feeling that, you know, school is finished and you sort of drop everything. And, yeah. uh, and it's a muscle and that would, you have to exercise. Yeah. yeah. So how you, a couple questions come to mind. You, um, you know, you had this career as a scientist. Do you feel that that is helping you with your art now or with, with your work ethic? Um, I, I'm not sure it helps with the art, maybe in ways that I'm not conscious of. Uh -huh. um, it does help with the work ethic because, I mean, that's the first thing I thought when I went to the, to the SCBWI conference in New York, I thought these people are all incredibly nice to each other. Uh, that's not my experience of life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you take a lot of, of bad vibes. Um, Scientists know, are in, mean? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying they're mean, <laughs> but, you know, science review meetings are mean and <laughs> budget discussions are mean and personnel management is mean. And, you know, you, you learn to, I don't know, you just grow a tough skin. But I think this is true for every profession, you know, that... Um, and basically from any professional endeavor, if you practice it long enough, yeah. you, you get you know, exposed to a lot of unpleasant situations and, and you need to get through them and you grow a tough skin. Um, so you enter the game with, you know, a little bit, maybe less expectations of success and more expectations for hard work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what about your, um, your ability to just keep working? What motivates you? Like, like you, it sounds like you don't have to do all this work, but you are. And I think that's a problem that I, I get. I get questions from students all the time saying, you know, how do I find the motivation to, to put out the amount of work that I need to put out there? Uh, I'm afraid I, I might say something very politically incorrect here, but <laughs> this, you can, you can say it. I will regret it and everybody will hate me for this. <laughs> Be, oh, no, wait, wait, before you say it, before you say it, I have heard that the Swiss people are very direct and honest. And I'm not Swiss. <laughs> but you're Italian. <laughs> <laughs> but I've lived here for 16 years, so maybe it wraps up. I don't know. Um, I think if you have the problem of have finding the motivation to do art, then maybe it's not the right thing yeah. for you. Yeah, that's that's quite possible. I don't think that's politically incorrect at all. Maybe it's not a message that people like to hear. Um, but especially with art, maybe in, in other stuff, you can sort of force yourself and, and get through with it. Mm -hmm. But I think in art, if you don't feel the drive to do art, somehow, it's, you know, it's, I'm not sure it's going to work out. You know, it's funny. It's ironic because... We're going to podcast this afternoon for our Three Point Perspective podcast, and uh, one of the to a, a spoiler is kind of this one, and, and this won't won't release for probably a month or two. But um, the the topic is basically on um, skills that you need to have as an illustrator, and for me, one of them is the first one on my list is you have to love making art, right? And I'm, I'm surprised I'm going to share, I'll share the same story here, but I'm going to share it on the podcast as well. And that is, I have a friend who he was telling me, well, I, he's seen me drawn on my iPad and we both went to school together for illustration and he's been doing other things now. And he says, maybe I should get an iPad to, you know, I'm like, why, you know? And he goes, well, it looks like fun what you're doing. You know, I might want to draw again. And I, I can be very, this is a, a friend that I've had for a long time and we can be very direct with each other. And I told him, you don't like to draw. And he was a, a little bit offended by it at first. And I, and he said, why, what makes you think I don't like to draw? And I go, you don't draw, you never draw. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
and he and he stopped for, and he said yeah you're probably right you know like and i said if you you'll just spend you know eight hundred dollars on an ipad and a hundred dollars on the pencil and it'll probably just sit there like you're like your pad of paper yeah so yeah. I think, you know, there's, there is this writer, it's called, his name is Mark Manson. I cannot say the name of his book because there's a swear word in it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but you can look it up. Uh, and he writes, uh, he writes this, this chapter about the fact that you need to enjoy the journey. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, there are too many people who fall in love with the goal. You know, they fall in love with the idea of being a famous, singer or yes. I'm a famous musician or I don't know, a published author, whatever. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and they're not really in love with, with the work or yep. with the, you know, with the thing that it takes to get there. They're in love with the goal. And and it's easy to be in love with these goals because they're desirable. You know, they're nice. So it's nice to be famous. It's nice to be successful. Uh, everybody would love that. Uh, you need to love the journey. If you don't love the journey, it's not the right choice that's right um and and that that really resonated with me and again you know and it's nice to be in the position where you don't need to earn money it makes you so it's, it's easier to be patient uh when when you are in that position but the truth is i think being successful as illustrator in the children's publishing and probably also in other areas it's a waiting game it's mm -hmm. uh long-term commitment it's not something that works out in six months or a year or two years or probably not even five years um so that's why you need to keep your day job and, yeah. and you know sit down and relax and do the work uh and it's and it's not five years of waiting it's five years of working yeah do you feel like um the the I, I get the feeling that your you know your, your finances are in pretty good um, order. Do you do you get do you feel that um, because of that you are more free to write about the things that you care about rather than than trying to second guess the market? Uh, yes and no. Um, I I guess I could enjoy more freedom than what I put myself. But yeah, I am in love with the goal too. You know, I want to yeah. be a published. Right? So, so you got to play. You got to still play the game. Um, maybe that yeah. wasn't the best question because I guess what I'm what I'm feeling is that when people put pressure on them on their art to to make money, they might make different decisions. I know I did. Yeah. Early on, I I took work that I didn't like, and I felt like it really stunted my career. Um, I, I actually, I actually, uh, I tried to make, I tried to gear my portfolio to go after what I thought would, would pay me money, which was the, um, the editorial, yeah. uh, corporate editorial work. And, um, and because I didn't like it, I wasn't that great at it. I was good enough at, I was in the right place at the right time. Um, and I, it, it worked, I, I made money doing it, but I had to slowly, transition over to what I really wanted to do. And I feel like that really um, kind of took a toll as far as the amount of time. Yeah, so. I think I think you've got a good point. And maybe I'm not being fully honest, because I am turn I did turn down jobs. Uh, and I did, I do turn down systematically a kind of work that would pay a lot, but I don't want to do which is animation work. Oh, right. Yeah. Animation for corporate, right for corporate customers. And, and I, I don't really enjoy doing that anymore. And I don't want to do it, even though probably I would be, you know, I would be working as a full-time illustrator much quicker if I did that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's so, not that, so, that, uh, so it does afford you the ability yeah. to, to make better decisions. And I, I have a friend who, um, I, I've talked about him a lot. In, on on my YouTube channel uh, many times, and that's Brett Helquist. And but he really, um, you know, he's the one that did the series of unfortunate events, and he um, he really was very picky, and I feel like that really paid off for him in the long run. He really 
turn down the work that really wasn't going to take him in the right direction and only focused on the work that he really wanted to do. And because of that, I think he was, he really um, poured his heart and soul into doing Mm -hmm. the kind of work that he wanted. And that got him more of what he wanted and that got him better and better jobs. Um, So, yeah. Um, Okay. So let's, um, let's finish up with what advice would you give to up and coming illustrators knowing what you know now, do they, or do they need to become a scientist first? Is that? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, don't take big detours. Um, what advice would I give? Um, okay. Um, put your work out there. Um, I know, you know, there is this, always this discussion about when are you ready and, you definitely, you know, should wait until you're fairly confident that what you're doing is is at least at a decent level compared to artists you admire or, you know. But I think, um, you know, if you don't if you don't live out there, if you don't put your work out, if you don't go to conferences or talk with people or show your portfolio or you know, even have a portfolio to show or you're not gonna you're not you're not gonna get any work <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's as simple as that um it's uh, it, it seems weird but there are a lot of people who are afraid of of putting their work of showing their work or of bringing a portfolio along to you know a fair or a conference um and i think that's that's something that needs to be done yeah. there is no way out of that um another thing that i would advise people to do is to pin their work on the wall. um i think especially if you work digitally i mean i do work digitally so it's, there is a tendency of keeping your stuff on the computer and never looking at it mm-hmm. and my work has really started to change and grow in the moment where i put it out on the wall together with work of artists i admire um i think there is a there is a whole course on SVS about, you know, doing this as an exercise of confronting, you know, comparing your work to the one of people uh, you want to, you know, right. imitate or, or be in the same category with. And it, it really opens your eyes when you put your work side by side. And I think you need to have it out there in front of your computer, you know, in front of your wall, not in your computer where you may look at it every once in a while. You need to see it every day. You need to have that that dose of honesty, right? That, yeah. that reality check of am I it's it's funny because I remember um I remember being a student and I, I would walk the halls in in the university that I went to and uh especially specifically in the art building and they you know teachers would have put artwork up and there were a few friends who were um who were just doing amazing to me it was amazing work at the time and i went back uh, about a year ago and looked at some of that work um, on one of my friend's websites i wanted to go back because i knew he had an archive and i went back and looked at some of those early pieces and i'm amazed at how they're not amazing anymore you know so our perception will constantly change and I think I think our perception and the perception of my own work was much better than my work. I mean, I, my I you know I think as artists we have this optimism that we're not that bad, and yet we're horrible in the beginning, right? <laughs> right, and then comes the phase which I am in now, where everything you do looks like crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it and it's <laughs> and it's hard to have that honest conversation. But what you're talking about is placing your work right next to yeah. the work of the people that you're looking up to the professionals and trying to make those analytical decisions on why is, why is this professional work so much better than mine? What changes, what alterations could I make um, to become there? And, and I, I think that's great advice. Cause I think that's, um, that's really when people get that, yeah. when people get finally get frustrated with their current level of work, their current output that's when real improvements can start to happen and uh, when you're in denial you're just not you're not ready yeah 
Yeah. And you know, at the beginning, uh, at the beginning, and I remember that phase. You know, you look up at, at the artists you admire, and you think, I want to be just like them. And yeah. and you try, you know, to steer your work in that direction. And then at some point, and my style is not settled at all. But at some point, you start thinking, uh, not you know, I I want to be like them, but what what can I learn from them and apply it to my own stuff? So it yeah. becomes a different kind of analysis, but it's yeah. still it's still very very important. Yeah. And and now you know there is not any more one artist I look up and say I want to be like him, but there is maybe ten or fifteen or twenty which I like for different reasons, and and that's I think what in the end shapes your style. I mean, style is a big topic, and, and maybe it's not. <laughs> the yeah, time no, no. To touch on it that, now. <laughs> yeah, talk t- talk about your style a little bit because that was something that was. I had that as one of the questions. Um, um, you know, your style is is becoming very unique, and I I spot it right away now. How did you how did you get there? It, I think you've already hinted at it, but you don't. It, it just comes. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's like in, I don't know. A, a month ago, I was obsessed with style. You know, I was obsessed with you know. How am I going to be different than anybody else? And what is my style actually? And you know, why can't I be more like this artist or that artist? Or I don't know. I I, I was obsessed with how you can interpret the same thing in different way, and how can you you know be consistent, but at the same time don't get pigeonholed in doing only one thing and all that sort of things that I think are on the mind of every person starting out in illustration. And and now I just don't care. <laughs> uh, you know, there are things that come natural to me, and there are things that I really are really really hard. And maybe the things that are really hard are just never gonna be a part of my style, even though I I always trying. Right. I would like, think. For example, I'm I'm a big fan of Charlie Harper, and and you wouldn't oh, believe yeah. that looking at my work. And yeah. I look at his work and I think this is just awesome. Why can't I do stuff like this? Uh, but the truth is, I can't. You know, I sit yeah. there and try, and it just crap. It just yeah. doesn't come that way. Yeah, because you think differently. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, his his work is. Uh, I love the simple design. Um, it's got to drive you crazy. I would think it would drive a scientist crazy. Because you're in science, you know, there are, there are answers. And now you're dealing with this world of uh, judgment calls and uh, everything is subjective. And <laughs> But science is not as precise as people think. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah. And, and there is one piece of advice that I would oh, love to give to people. And- Sometimes I really have to hold back in the forums because I also think it's not very popular advice. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I, I think people underestimate the amount of work. Yes. Um, I don't know how to say this, but you know, just drawing half an hour a day is, is not enough. It's yeah. probably never going to be enough. And, yep. uh, I think I think if I have to credit art school with something is teaching students to do an unbelievable amount of work yeah. uh, in a very short time, and it it marks you for life. Okay, you come out and you know exactly what it means to do the amount of work. Or you know the amount of work that it takes to actually improve. Um, and and you never forget that lesson. You know yeah. when you've been through assignments of doing. <laughs> An assignment of doing 100 thumbnails in a week, yeah, uh, or you know, and that was maybe only part of the work. You had 100 thumbnails and I don't know, uh, 20 animal sketches and three full paintings, and and that was a week's workload, yeah, um, on, on some semesters, right, on some terms, and and that's you know, you never forget that. You never forget a that you can do that kind of work, and you never forget how low the improvement is, even with that amount of work. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a it's a hard message to give, I find. 
Yeah. That's one of our challenges with uh, SVS is because we're not a traditional uh, four year program. Uh, and because we don't, you know, or we don't have, obviously we don't have a, a graduate program or anything like that. We it's, it's kind of a, the downside is it's an a la carte, you know, you go at your own pace, you have to find the motivation to push yourself. And I try to, I'm not the kind of, even when, you know, when I taught um, at university, I, I was never the type of teacher that um, would get mad at my students for not doing enough work. I would, I just can't, I can't do that. I, it's not in me. Um, but I try to help them understand by giving them um, examples of why they need to work so hard and basically trying to talk them through it. And I figure some people will will understand my message and others won't and being angry. You know, like I've, I've you've heard the stories of some teachers, you know, throwing paintings out the window and and trying to, you know, like the um, I don't know if you saw that movie Drumline. Did you ever see that? No, I don't think so. Was it Drumline? No, it wasn't Drumline. It was it was the one where the teacher is is teaching the drummer and um and he's extremely his tactics are barbaric i think you know he nothing is ever good enough and you i guess you could make an argument on why that could work it does, doesn't work for me but um but i i fully agree with you i think that's probably one of the biggest problems that students have is they're not committed enough to spending the the kind of time i remember when i was playing the cello i had private lessons in high school and my teacher was telling me if you take this and if you decided to play the cello in in college you're going to be expected to play to practice for about six hours a day and um and that probably won't be enough if you want to make a career out of it you know that you you've got to basically be you are married to your instrument and you play it from morning till night basically if you want to compete with the highest yeah. levels and the same is really true for illustration i mean uh um you have to fall in love with the cool thing to me is you don't have to you don't have to have that the ability to work extremely hard from the time you're young it can be developed over time i i, I feel like you can fall in love with um your work over time you you can get more and the better it gets the, the more fun it is right right you can get more and more addicted to it and it becomes easier and easier to spend more butt time in the chair right yeah. um and so don't i wouldn't i don't want to scare anyone off if they're like i can only stand to draw for two or three hours a day you know you can develop it and you have to develop it if you're gonna i think that's what you're saying right you have to develop it yeah, I mean, you you uh, compared art to music uh, on another occasion too, and I think it's absolutely right. It's it's the same with sports. You know, you want to be a professional athlete, you, you cannot do it by jogging around the block once a day. It's just yeah. not gonna work. And it's the same with music, and it's the same with art. I think you know there are exceptions, of course, but on average, I think if if you're not incredibly talented or incredibly lucky and you've got exactly the style that is in demand at this very moment uh it, it takes a lot of work yeah um and yep. that's why you know when people come to you oh, how can i learn to draw i don't know the human figure or hands or faces or whatever and you know it's easy you sit there and, and draw 500 of them. And I guarantee you, <laughs> it doesn't matter where you start, you know, even if you can only draw a stick figure, I guarantee you after 500 figure studies, you know how to draw the figure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, uh, and it's, you know, it's easy. It's really, it really is. <laughs> it doesn't require any special yeah. magic. It's, it's just really putting in the amount of work that it takes for your brain to learn it and for your hands to follow your brain and for your yeah. eyes to see things and, and all that comes with it. Well, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Um, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. And I hope that someday I get to meet you in person. Um, <laughs> Switzerland has definitely always been on my bucket list. You've and been here, right? You've even been in Basel once. What's that? 
You have been in Basel, I think. No, no. No? No. Uh, all the pictures of mountains in the background for me are out here in the in the West, in the United States. So, um, But I, I have a friend that uh, was living in Switzerland for a while, and I just kind of fell in love with the, the idea. And the, so, yeah, that's someday. And, and if you ever come here, it'd be great to to meet you and maybe maybe even have you teach for us someday. So. I definitely come to visit if I have a chance. <laughs> well, um, thanks a lot. And uh, I'm really glad that you were able to do this. I think it'll really help our students. And I will hopefully see you on Facebook and in the forums. And Thank you. Uh, do you guys say ciao? <laughs> yeah, ciao. <laughs> and I can say auf Wiedersehen. Uh, auf Wiedersehen, yeah. <laughs> I took a year of German in uh, high school. So, yeah. And I also watched Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. So, a feed us okay. in. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.